Ricky went to prison for two years because of what he believed. He could have avoided that if he'd have only been willing to plead guilty for something he didn't do. There wouldn't even have been a fine. Now, I find that incredible to put yourself through that. You're in solitary confinement for part of it. What I'm curious to find out about, though, is when you began to have this self-belief and stick up for what you believe in and not back down under any circumstances. Well, from the age of 17, I was, I, the first time I was a shop steward, I was only 17 years of age, working on a, on a site in Carrington. Um, so I've, I've always believed in sort of workers' rights. Uh, I, I come from a very sort of um, old-fashioned royalist family. I mean, you wouldn't believe that. They were working class, they had nothing. And, and, and my grandparents had less than us, and, and they were staunch conservatives. Staunch. The first time I seen my dad cry, in fact, I think it was the only time I seen him cry, was when the old king died. And I, and I couldn't get my head around that, you know. But we've always been passionate about, about uh, rights for people. And so, obviously, I've, I've been a shop steward umpteen times. But when the building site came about in 1972... I, I took part in this. I was a shop steward. I was, I was one of the leaders of the North Wales Strike Action Committee, and uh, we had a very, very successful campaign during that strike, which lasted between I don't know twelve or fourteen weeks. Well, it's the, it was an official strike, the one and only one the building industry's ever had, and it was so successful that five months after the strike was over, the bosses decided to teach us a lesson. And so the big building firms got together with the government and brought these charges. But when the police came to see me, they wanted me to be a prosecution witness because my politics had been far different than some of the lads who were involved in the Strike Action Committee. And I said, well, no, how can I be, how can I be a witness against them? I was one of them and I was proud to be one of them. A, I, I wanted to know what was going on and B, I wanted my say. And so they said, well, if you don't, we'll have to charge you, which they did. And I ended up getting two years and, and me mate Tessie got three. And another lad called Mackenzie Jones, who wasn't, e we got charged with conspiracy. This other lad, Mackenzie Jones, wasn't even at the meeting where the conspiracy was supposed to have taken place, and he got a year. But I'm glad to say he, 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 he was able to go to an open prison and, and get in and out as quick as he can. Me and Desi decided to do it hard. We wouldn't wear clothes, we wouldn't work, we, we caused as much trouble as we could. Um, and so obviously spent most of our time in, uh, in, in solitary confinement when we wouldn't wear clothes. But it was during that time that the, the, the governor of Leicester was a man called Norman Hill, who'd been an ex-bricklayer, who'd had to leave the, the building industry because of the arthritis and rheumatism in his hands. And he gave me this book, I'll never forget, he said, have you read this book? And, and he was a unique prison governor because he walked around the prison on his own. Normally they have a guard or two with them, you know, in case anyone checked him. This guy always walked around on his own. And he said, have you read this book, Tamo? And I said, w w what is it, Mr Hill? He said, it's, it's called uh, The Ragged Trousered Philanthropist. And I said, no, no, I haven't. And he said, well, have a read of that. And he, and he gave me this book. He didn't lend it me, he gave it me. And w once I was into the first page, the hair on, on the back of my neck stuck up. It was amazing. It's an amazing book. And it changed. It obviously was one of the major factors in changing the direction in which the rest of my life would go. And by that time, I'd already started listening to classical music and radio for because there's nothing else to do in solitary confinement, apart from doing a bit of writing on toilet paper. You know, you've got to write it because I smuggled it all out, or most of it out later on. But that book has, has become so important to me, and people have read articles about it that I've actually sent, people have wrote to me and said, look, we can't get us here where we are. And I've sent them to China, I've sent them to America, Australia, New Zealand, I've sent them everywhere copies of this book and it's a wonderful wonderful honestly it's a wonderful book and it's and i would recommend it i would recommend it to anyone but the time in solitary confinement as i say um your politics change and your thoughts change and, and as i say i'd started doing a little bit of writing realized how much i'd missed writing since you know since i wanted to be one at the age of 13 and stuff like that and uh, it was just another experience you know it was just another day in the life of ricky tomo do you regret anything you did to end up there? I think you were made an example of from what I read in the book and what, from what I've read previously. But would you still do the same again in terms of standing up for what you believe in? Oh, yeah. I mean, don't forget. I mean, as, when we were in court on, on the day the trial started, and this wasn't just an ordinary trial, by the way, although the authorities tried to say it was. I want, I want some of your listeners to try and visualise this. We're at the court. There's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of policemen outside there's hundreds more inside the court buildings. There's policemen with Alsatian dogs. There's policemen on the, on the roofs of buildings around the courthouse with video cameras. There's riot fellas in, in, in vans secreted around the building. There's, and what, what for? There's six ordinary building workers from North Wales on trial. 
So we, we knew right from the start that something was, was, was going on. We didn't realise how bad it was going to be. But when we were actually in the cells, before the trial started, the barristers come in and said, there's a deal on, on offer here. If you plead guilty, you can, you're can you going to get fined 50 quid. The union are going to pay the 50 pound and you'll walk out, you'll, you'll only be in court half an hour. And four of the lads said they wanted to take the deal. I said I wouldn't. I had no um, criminal past. I've got no police record, never been in trouble with the police. So I'm not taking the deal. And Desi Warren said he wouldn't take the deal. And to be fair to the other four lads, they said, well, if you two are not, we're not. So it ended up the six of us pleaded not guilty and, and went and stood trial. The trial lasted 55 days. I was in the witness box for three days. The judge was an absolute joke. Um, we had some of the leading counsel in, in, in the country, John Platts Mills, Keith McHale, David Altaris, you know, uh, real big names like defending us. And I mean, we, we were prosecuted by a guy who's now a, a High Court judge called Modest Street QC. But the trial, the trial was just a show trial. And career, and we're talking at the moment about one of his darkest moments when he was in court and subsequently sent down for two years for something he didn't do. All he did, in fact, was stick up for what he believed. And we found out so far that you could have got off had you have only pleaded guilty. You were not willing to do that. Um, and there was an interesting moment in court when the jury found out a revelation, wasn't there? Gee, the jury were out overnight and couldn't couldn't come to a unanimous verdict. And when, when they, they were told by a court usher that if they did find us guilty, that we were going to get fined 50 quid, and the union were going to pay the £50, which was the same as we'd been told at the start of the trial. Two of them changed their mind, so they, they, they then had a majority verdict. When I got sentenced to two years, one of the jury men jumped up, turned round and started having a go at another guy in the jury box, and actually left the jury box and went into the jury room. So they had to send for him and bring him back, because apparently, I don't know, apparently um, the, the jury's got to be there till the judge finishes his sentencing. And then he gave Desi Warren the three years. And that's when we made our speeches from the dock, saying how the trial had been politically motivated, how we were pawns in the trial, and stuff like that. And so, um, and, and so that really happened to begin in the end. That's when we went in and, and decided that we wanted to be reclassified as political prisoners. And the funny thing is, every time we were visited by what they call the visiting magistrates, all they wanted to do was say, you're sorry, and they let you go. And of course, I wouldn't say I was sorry ever. Uh, but they said, look, we, we don't have such a thing in, in England as political prisoners, so we can't classify you as one. But I, I remember getting interviewed by a priest, a Roman Catholic priest, for this parole board. And, and I'm not a Roman Catholic priest, but I've still have, obviously had a lot of respect for the man. And he said to me, you must, you must understand, Rick, he said, you're a political prisoner, and we've got seven in jail in England at the moment. Now, he was the only one who was up front. Uh, I've got an idea who a couple of the others would be. I think that the Price Girls were, were, were in jail from Ireland at the time, the Price Sisters. And I, I don't know who the others were at the time, but there was me and Desi, the Price Sisters. Probably people like John Stonehouse or Carl Milhenge who'd been involved in the Harold Wilson uh, slaggy scandal and stuff like that. I think they, but I don't know who the others were, to be honest with you. Did anything positive come from the time you spent by yourself in that cell? I mean, it must have just been the worst time ever. I can't imagine a worse thing to happen, knowing in your heart that you shouldn't have been there. Did you learn anything? Did anything positive come out of that? Yeah, I'm, 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 I just, there's loads of positive things come out of it. I mean, I, I, I remember a fellow coming up to me one day and he said, I just can't believe the sentence you've got, mate. He said, I can't believe it. He said, I'm so sorry for you. And, and he walked away. And I, and I said to someone, I said, Who, who's that? He said, oh, he's doing a double life sentence. This fellow's doing double life. And he's telling me how sad it is because he, he obviously had more, more nows than me. No one had been set up by the system. But a lot of positives come out. I met some smashing people in, inside. I met people inside who shouldn't be inside. And that's what makes me quite angry when I read about Geoffrey Archer, who's now an authority on prison. Well, I just say to, I challenge Geoffrey Archer, say, how do you know about prison, Geoffrey? You haven't been to prison. You've been to a holiday camp. Because all the time I was in prison, and I got moved about time and time into different prisons all over the place, Stafford, Shrewsbury, Leicester, London prisons, blah, blah. I never met anyone who got a job in a theatre like he did. I never met anyone who was allowed to wear their own suit like he did. I never met anyone who could go for lunch with prison officers to fancy restaurants like he did. He's never been to jail and he's got the cheek to sit down and write prison diaries. 
and also at the same time reading the paper in one of the broadsheets the week before last about Ramsbottom, who's the inspector of prisons, actually made overtures to the prison authority to move Jonathan Aitken when he was in jail from one cushy open prison to an even cushier open prison near to where his son was at school in Eton. So you see, the class system is alive and well and thriving in Britain. We've talked a lot about your life and things that have happened to you. We talked about prison just there. And now I want to talk to you about something that affected me. Whilst on holiday in Greece over the summer, I could only get the Daily Mail and you were front page. And there was an article that was allegedly written by your ex-wife that said the most dreadful things about you, that you had more or less abandoned your children uh, from your first wife and uh, all kinds of things that really I don't even want to repeat on the air. Firstly, I don't know whether anything in this article was true. I don't know whether your ex-wife was misquoted. But what I do know is that some people may have got a perception of you that isn't the case from this article. Firstly, how do you cope with such a extreme attack on your nature and the fact that you have no reply whatsoever? Well, hey, you have to tolerate it, don't you? Because it, it costs an awful lot of money to challenge it. But um, how, how they write it is, is they pay a lot of money for them articles. And so I was married for 24 years. And that girl had some hard times. We had hard times. We had three kids, three smashing kids. But I've been divorced for 18 years. Not 18 months, 18 years. And she puts a story in the paper every year. Now, that's fine. It doesn't bother me. I am used to it. But this time, I had a phone call on a Saturday morning from Caroline Hayden's brother, who said Caroline was bored in the plane for New York and she'd seen this and she it had upset her so she'd phoned him to ring me and just say she was thinking about me which I thought was lovely so I went and got the newspaper when I read the article I was appalled really I mean I don't know I don't know what the reason is but obviously apart from the fact that she's obviously getting paid a lot a lot of money for these articles uh, but so be it two things dawned on me when I read it one that it must crush you as, as a father and as a former husband and secondly the perception that some people may actually believe what is written oh, yeah. it's got to hurt you and, and as you say you really have no comeback whatsoever do you I've got very little comeback and, and what hurts it for me is is, 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 it, is it splits the loyalty of the, of the kids because they obviously love their mum and, and she's been good to them by the way I would never take that up I was never afraid when I was in prison of anything happening to them kids because she'd have been like a, a tigress you know she defended them with their life but I mean it, how, how do you say to the kids um, why is your mum writing this because they don't want to take sides and that's quite right and, and, and proper but it can't go on forever I can't have this every year when she's short of a few, Bob, I cannot have her putting these articles in the paper. OK, we'll leave that there. And uh, thank you for talking to us about it. It's all in the book. And one thing that I, I do congratulate you on is your honesty in the book. And you say on many occasions, I have made mistakes and, you know, I do regret them. Mm. But in life, you learn from them. And, and, and that's the thing that I can say you've, you've certainly pointed out in this book that you have learned from them. And mm. you're really happy now with Rita. You got married, as you say, earlier on in the year. And uh, congratulations for that. Very finally, let's talk about the royal family, because this is the thing that shot you into huge mega stardom. Um, you'd already been in Brookside with Sue, and then you, you married her a second time to be in the royal family. Mm. I mean, I, I, there's no point in us even talking about this, because we can't do justice to how brilliant that programme is. It was sensational, wasn't it? And it was just Caroline Hearn's idea. She, she, she knew exactly what she was doing. We made the first episode and she wasn't happy with it and she had it scrapped and she read on it the way she wanted to do it and she wouldn't have an audience and she wouldn't have canned laughter and it was all brand new and it's down to it I, I mean I mean in, in reality she has got genius IQ I know that she's got um, I, I don't know what mental IQ for something like 174 or something but she is a genius but she's a genius as a human being she's fabulous I've never been treated so well so kindly she's she's generous in every way I mean she could keep the laps in the, in the show for herself she doesn't she gives them to me or she gives them to Sue and to, but she's she's absolutely she's a, she's a brilliant writer and I'm delighted that she's writing she's just writing a new series of Mrs. Merton so as I say that means she probably might lead on to doing the odd special of the royal family which I would love to do you know I feel so bad for her because she's such a talent in terms of her writing and performance that the demons inside of her seem to get the better of her so often and it's such a shame that no uh, you see I, you, you, you're you're 
believe in what you've read in the paper. All this stuff about being a binge drinker and all like that's a load of nonsense. And what's uh, this report that's just come out, they've spent years trying to define what a binge drinker is, and they've said now anyone who has more than four pints is a binge drinker. Well, 75% of the population must be binge drinkers. I mean, sometimes I'm, I'm, sometimes I don't have a drink for six months, seven months or whatever, but if I go out, I certainly have more than four pints, but I wouldn't class myself as a binge drinker. They've given her this title, which she doesn't deserve. She doesn't drink when she's working. We, 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 she takes us out for the meal, we, we have a drink with the meal and stuff like that. But when she's working, I work with her for six weeks at a time, don't forget. She doesn't touch it off. And she's well, is she now? She's OK? According to my brother Patrick, who's a lovely character, she's fabulous, yeah. Fantastic. I'm really glad to hear that. And I'm so glad that um, she's she's working again and that you hopefully will make another programme with her. Let's keep her fingers crossed. Ricky Tomlinson, we're out of time. It's been such a pleasure talking to you. And I thank you for your time because I know you're really busy at the moment with this new book. It's called Ricky. If you want to read a really honest book about how to make a mistake and how to make it better, there is no better example than Ricky Tomlinson. I credit you so much for standing up for what you believe. And that's really what you get from this book. Even if you go to prison for it, stand up for what you believe. I've tried Cheers, kid. Thank you.